A very good afternoon to all the delegates. Uh, since uh, we see a lot of people will be joining in between, but again, uh, as per the schedule, on behalf of uh, Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, we welcome you for this webinar on learnings from COVID-19 uh, systems thinking and sustainable transformation. Uh, we heartily welcome Professor Wayne Wizer for agreeing to conduct this webinar. Uh, let me just mention a few uh, things before we begin the session. That, uh, uh, firstly, a few instructions that uh, you have been given the chat rights, so you can simply type your questions and clarifications or comments, uh, which will be taken up uh, by the professor. I shall uh, do the needful. And also, at the beginning of the session, uh, there will be two polling questions with five options each that will be appearing on your screen. So kindly choose uh, the appropriate option. Uh, we give you five minutes time for these two polling questions, and uh, then we will just uh, have an introduction of Professor Wizer and the objective of this session. And then I would request subsequently to Professor Wizer to talk. So please. Uh, the, you can see the polling questions. Please select. So I, I repeat, uh, welcome, welcome all for this session. My name is Garima Dadich. I'm a faculty at Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. IICA is a think tank of Ministry of Corporate Affairs, and there are uh, practitioners and academicians working in think tank under the able leadership of Dr. Samir Sharma, DG and CEO of IICA. Today we have with us Professor Wayne Wizer for the webinar on learnings from COVID-19 systems thinking and sustainable transformation. And we are just doing uh, two polling questions now. Uh, so requesting all to please select an appropriate option. So as we as we know that uh, systems thinking is a cross-sectoral purpose and innovation driven methodology it has become highly re relevant to respond to the problems and this system thinking approach implies framing everything in terms of relationships patterns and context the webinar with professor w professor Wieser will reflect on the lessons learned from covid-19 from systems thinking perspective and discuss how emergence can bring about sustainable transformation. Let me also have a, a short, uh, give you a short introduction. Although Professor Wayne Wizer is well known, uh, Professor Wayne Wizer is a professor of integrated value and holder of the chair in sustainable transformation at Antwerp Management School, Belgium. He is one of the world's top 10 most influential faculty thinkers on the issues of responsible business in social media. He's among top 100 influencers on CSR and sustainable business, top 100 thought leaders in trustworthy business, and top 100 sustainability leader. He is author of 38 books and 300 plus so, papers, articles, and chapters. And he is also known as a pracademic because he brings, you know, he married the practice and the academic. And he has been to 77 countries over the last 25 years, lecturing at more than 50 uh, universities. He is head tutor and fellow of the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, director of the think tank and media company, Kaleidoscope Futures, and founder of CSI International. That's a very brief introduction, uh, Professor Wizer. So I once again thank you for agreeing for this uh, session on systems thinking and sustainable transformation. Through this webinar, we will definitely uh, understand the areas of systemic breakdown, which are the forces of fragmentation that threaten to undermine the multi-level systems on which we rely for a well-functioning society and good quality of life in the context of pandemic. 
So without taking much time between Professor Wizer and you, I would now request Professor Wizer to kindly begin the session. Well, thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure to be spending some time with you. Um, if you could uh, just share the slides, that would be great. So I want to just um, take a little bit of time to reflect on what systems thinking really means for um, uh, for sustainability, for CSR, um, and for business in general, and to really break it down and focus on one particular element in uh, which is uh, which is emergence. So I'll share with you this slide, and I'm going to only leave it up for a minute or two, and then I'll stop it while I continue to talk. So uh, uh, feel free to take a screenshot or or whatever. But I'll talk through these principles of emergence and also the processes. Now, emergence is a, a, a phenomenon that occurs naturally in all living systems. And you will probably recognize it as the, the idea of synergy. So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And what happens in living systems, of which societies and organizations are also a part, is that this spontaneous emergence occurs and the emergence comes with certain new behaviors, new characteristics, uh, innovation, if you like. And I really think this is a helpful way to reflect on um, how we've been responding to COVID-19, but more generally on how we should be thinking in a new way about CSR and sustainability. So um, I'm going to stop that uh, slide now and just going to talk you through these principles. We'll put it up again uh, halfway through. But if we start with the principle of coherence, so in any living system, um, you have a, a function or a purpose. Now, in biological systems, that's often uh, determined by DNA or by instinct. But in many social systems, uh, we have more uh, of a intentional coherence through our strategic uh, directions that we set, our goals, uh, or through leadership. But it's important to realize that uh, often coherence also comes spontaneously. And here we can learn also from nature. So if you look at an ant colony, this is a very complex social system that exists. And Ants do many things in the colony. So some will be out foraging for food. Some will be defending the nest and the queen. Some will be taking out the trash, literally uh, what's left over from the food, and they put it in a particular place. Some will be burying the dead. There is always a place in the, in the colony that is a, a cemetery. And what's quite interesting about this is nobody is telling them to do this. There is no leader. The queen is not the leader. The queen is just a, an egg-laying machine, really. Um, but through the interaction between ants, this behavior, this coordinated coherence uh, emerges. And it emerges because there are a few simple rules applied. In the case of ants, it's through pheromone trails and simple language that they have. Um, but in the case of humans, of course, uh, it can be through our interactions uh, with, with each other that we can spontaneously organize. Um, you're probably also familiar with the idea of the flocking of birds, how birds can move together, sometimes in thousands or even millions. Uh, they call this murmuration in English. And what's interesting here is if you apply this to human systems, uh, there are experiments that have been done. Uh, and the question is, how much would it take for people to be aligned in a particular crowd or group for those aligned 
people to move the whole group in a particular direction. So if you think of a random crowd and you start to add people to that crowd who try to move the crowd, how many would you need to add? And it turns out from the scientific experiments, it's only between five and 25%. So a minority of people with a common goal, even if they don't know the other people who share that goal, can move a whole system. And I think this is really important. Uh, Let's think about what's been happening with COVID-19. So here we've had uh, societies, governments, and business behaving in certain ways. And a lot of the ways that we're behaving is based on what we see others doing. So we're looking around the world. We're seeing what's working. Of course, we look to China first, what was their experience, but then to Europe, uh, now to Asia and, and, and the Americas. And we're basically learning from each other in real time. And certain behaviors like lockdown, like social distancing, um, have emerged as a, a good way to, to tackle and to uh, defeat this uh, virus, this pandemic. So it's important to remember then when you think about other challenges that we face, uh, whatever the challenge might be, if you're looking to tackle poverty or you're looking to make your workforce more inclusive, more gender balanced, or you're looking to, to tackle water or, or biodiversity loss, um, it's really important, if possible, to have a common goal and to communicate that goal as clearly as possible. Of course, we have things like the sustainable development goals now, but whatever it is, uh, if it's communicated through your system, and your system could be your organization, could be your industry or your society, then people will self-organize in order to make uh, progress towards that goal. You don't need to be dictating to people or forcing them or controlling them. If they believe in the goal and the common purpose, they will move. The second principle is complexity and complexity here in a systems thinking uh, science doesn't mean complicatedness it means the number of relationships in a system yeah the more connections you have in a in a system the more complex it is and what the science has uh, found out is that the more complex a system the more likely that we will have so-called butterfly effects i'm sure you've heard of this phrase that if a butterfly flaps its wings in one part of the world, it may cause a, a, a hurricane or a typhoon in another part of the world. This is actually based on mathematical science, chaos theory in particular. Um, and it was first noticed by a meteorologist who was modeling weather systems and just actually made an error in one of his calculations, a very, very tiny error. And it turned out that the, the outcome of the prediction, the forecast, was completely different. And so what this means for us is that we need to think about all of the small actions we're taking. And sometimes the smallest of action can be that butterfly effect, that tipping point that might shift a whole system. Uh, so in the case of COVID-19, of course, you know, people making innovations that may actually prove to be incredibly important in the end. Uh, there's, a, there's a company, for example, that has now made a plastic-free and completely compostable uh, face mask for people to wear during COVID-19. Um, because, of course, one of the side effects that we're seeing with all the PPE is, is the proliferation of single-use plastic and, and the throwaway society. So we see now these small actions that may ripple through the system. Um, in the case of sustainability and CSR more generally, again, you never know what solution you come up with may be really significant. To keep with the theme of plastic for a moment, um, there was a microbiologist who discovered at a, a near a bottle recycling plant, plastic bottle recycling plant in Japan, that there was a plastic eating bacteria there. Uh, another one was found in Houston, Texas. Um, and uh, 
these could be the things that in the end help us to really clean up uh, the crisis that we have in plastic pollution around the world. Uh, a similar story from uh, Yellowstone National Park in the United States, uh, the geothermal hot springs, they discover a bacteria that uh, is very promising as a, for the production of alternative protein. And that's now been backed by capital from Bill Gates and from Al Gore. Uh, and this again could provide us a, a solution to the heavy impacts of the meat industry. So you never know where those uh, uh, innovations could come and the small effects in a complex interconnected system uh, of which we are living in today could be really important. The third principle is creativity. And of course, this is a lot to do with diversity. So we know from social and environmental systems, if you have diversity in the system, there's more chance that there will be creativity and innovation. Part of this is making sure that we also preserve diversity of ecological systems. If you look at rice as one example, right, there are about 40,000 species of rice in the world, but three and a half billion people in the world rely on rice of only a few species like long grain or basmati or Thai rice. So what, what makes, uh, what that implies is that we're in fact very vulnerable. Now, fortunately, we have the International Rice Gene Bank that has collected 90,000 samples of very diverse rice so that if ever we needed it, um, if we needed to bring the creativity back, we would be able to draw on those banks. And of course, it applies to many, many issues. It's diversity in your workplace, uh, it's diversity in uh, the activities, whether it's uh, the type of economic activities that, uh, that you encourage. The more diversity that you can have, the more resilient and the more creative uh, it will all be. And of course, you know, we've seen uh, some of the creativity through the coronavirus, whether it's uh, universities like my own very rapidly pivoting to 100% uh, online teaching, or uh, workplaces uh, using all of the video conferencing uh, to keep their, their businesses going. Uh, the fourth principle is convergence. And this is the idea that change really happens when certain things come together. You get a perfect storm, if you like. And to give you a few examples, between 1900 and 1913, New York City went from a horse and carriage dominated city to an automotive vehicle dominated city. Now just think about that. This was already a very large city. And within 13 years, the entire mode of transport changed. And this was as a result of a convergence of certain technologies that were coming together at the time. So the internal con combustion engine, cheaper fossil fuel production, and mass production uh, uh, through the assembly line, Henry Ford's model. So we see this in many ways, and often we underestimate the power of convergence. For example, McKinsey, the global consulting firm, was asked by AT&T, the uh, telecoms company in America, to make a 15-year forecast in 1985 of the potential growth of mobile phones. And they estimated that the mobile phones by the year 2000 would reach 900,000 sales. The actual number by 2000 was 109 million sales. So they were out just within a 15-year forecast, they were out by a factor of 120 because they didn't understand the principle of convergence. And we can see many examples today. The computer, the internet, and the mobile phone converged and created a whole new industry. Uh, we see it now, of course, also with the convergence of battery technology, artificial intelligence, and renewables also coming together with electric vehicles. And so we, we usually are underestimating some solutions. Um, and I think if you particularly look at renewables, that's the case today. Um, 
last year there was a, a deal struck for solar and battery power in Los Angeles that puts the price of solar and batteries at a cost that's half uh, the cost of a new natural gas plant. Uh, so today in, in two thirds of the countries around the world, uh, renewable energy is cheaper than any form of fossil fuel, be that coal, oil, gas or nuclear. Um, there's the uh, uh, Swanson's law where solar prices are dropping 20% for every doubling of shipped uh, volume. So every 10 years, the price is going down 75%. So I'm encouraging you as we're thinking about sustainability and CSR to really think about where is the convergence happening? What is the special combination of conditions or of technologies that could flip the system very rapidly? The final principle is the principle of continuity. Um, and this is really that in natural and social systems, um, the system tries to perpetuate itself, right? It becomes self-organizing, but also self-producing. It maintains and reproduces itself. And of course, we see that a lot in, in all kinds of organisms, but think about what it means for organizations, uh, what it means for companies. Most companies are not very good at uh, surviving uh, in a long term anymore. Uh, in 1935, the life expectancy of a S&P 500 company in the United States was 90 years. By 2010, it was 14 years. Yeah. So it means that it's far more difficult to survive today. And the advice really is to become a purpose-driven company. What is it that you want to survive and to perpetuate, that you want to continue? If it, you think it's only about your brand, or profitability, then the chances are you will go out of business in the short term. So we can take many examples, but I'll just give you one. In the 1890s, William Lever, founder of Lever Brothers, wrote down his idea for sunlight soap. We all know this uh, very simple product. And his idea was he wanted to make a product to make cleanliness commonplace, to lessen work for women, to foster health and contribute to personal attractiveness, and that life could be more enjoyable and rewarding for the people who use their products. That's a very powerful vision. That's a purpose that now more than 100 years later has seen Unilever become one of the largest and most successful, but also most sustainable and purpose-driven companies of the world. And this is one of the keys now to ensuring that we survive and thrive. Uh, we have to align our purpose with a social or an environmental mission. I'm not going to spend much time on the process of emergence, except to talk you through it very briefly. What basically happens is it starts with exploring. So there has to be, whether it's ants or people, going out uh, outside of their, their normal boundaries. They have to be uh, wandering and exploring and looking for something new. If you keep the people who are working for you just working on the same things in the same environment, in the same city, the chances of you getting innovation are very, very small. You have to allow people to explore. Of course, there's the famous uh, Google 20% rule, which they implemented in 2004 where engineers were allowed to spend 20% of their time on personal projects that could benefit the company. And that resulted in innovations like AdSense and Gmail, some of the biggest innovations they came up with. So don't, uh, don't keep people too controlled. You have to allow people to work on the fringe. Yeah, that's where the innovation happens. You have to, in a way, even allow people to be heretics. Yeah, we, we, we brand people heretics who are too different from us, but that's where the innovation comes. In fact, the Greek word for heretic comes from a word that means to be able to choose. So these are people who have independent thinking, and that's really important in CSR and sustainability as well. 
if we're just managing by uh, by standard, by code, by market expectations, the chances of innovation are much less. The second step in the process of emergence is exchanging. So basically, somebody goes out and explores, uh, but they have to meet others or new ideas, and they have to have an exchange. If there's no exchange, of course, you don't dis you don't uh, discover the the synergies. You don't discover the complementary skills or the complementary capitals. Maybe somebody has financial capital, you have intellectual capital, or maybe they spark your creativity and you ground them. You know, lots of different ways you can combine. Once you've combined, you've exchanged, then there's the process of exhibiting. This is basically now when you make visible this new behavior, this something that you've come up with a solution or an innovation. Uh, you can think in a way of a peacock that displays its feathers. Yeah? Suddenly you, you get a new behavior or a new product that you weren't expecting at all. Uh, and so this is the, the step of emergence. Uh, of uh, of exhibiting and then the fourth step is extending so it doesn't help if this new behavior just stays isolated it needs to spread it needs to be scaled up and it there are many ways that can happen today of course we see memes that go very rapidly uh, scale scaling across the system um, Mobile phones, for example, only took six years in Africa to go from zero to overtaking fixed lines between 1994 and 2000. Think of the smoking bans that have happened around the world, right? The first country to ban smoking was in 2004. That was Ireland. There are now 125 countries that have similar bans. And that's in just over 15 years. So change can happen very, very fast. Sometimes if we get these new behaviors to spread across the system, then we see a very rapid uh, flipping. The last uh, step in the process is encoding. And encoding means at some point then when we have the new behavior, we need to bed it down. We need to embed it. And often that happens through institutionalizing it and this may be through legislation it may be through policies and codes and standards or procedures and so this is the role for things like ISO 14000 or the global compact or the UN sustainable development goals these are important to solidify or uh, to perpetuate these new behaviors so I've been talking for a bit now if you could put the uh, slides back up, and then maybe we uh, we have a few questions before I go on to the second part. That's right, sir. So, uh, if slide we will certainly put up. Uh, so the the idea is, Professor, that integrating sustainability uh, into the strategy is certainly very important to the future-proof uh, businesses. But the, uh, what about the incremental improvement, which is not enough to win in today's exponentially disrupted business environment? So uh, the question here is, you know, how to prioritize the long-term goals in the light of the current crisis? And also, uh, there is a, uh, you know, how an organization integrate the systems thinking in its strategy without waiting for a crisis? Yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is in systems, all exponential change starts out as incremental change. Yeah, So you never know what incremental changes will become exponential because of the convergence, because the conditions are just right, or there's another technology that's supporting, or the, the, the moment is right in the culture, or some crisis does happen. So uh, I'm not against incrementalism, um, but I think if we see long periods of incremental and it's not really responding to the scale and the urgency of the challenges, then we have to, uh, we have to really worry about that and we have to then um, try to uh, tap into this innovation uh, model of, of emergence. And there are a number of ways that, that that happens. I mean, um, having a strong purpose is one. If you can send, if you can set a really 
bold, ambitious goal. Uh, this requires leadership, of course. The reason that Unilever became, for the last seven or eight years, voted the most sustainable company in the world is because of Paul Palman's uh, leadership and the Sustainable Living Plan, which had very ambitious goals to double in size while halving the environmental footprint, to help a billion people out of poverty, um, and to uh, improve the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of farmers. So, you know, it's, it's that vision that then causes people to say, okay, now I see the goal, uh, I can see that incremental improvement won't get me there, therefore I need to innovate. Uh, so sometimes it can be a proactive thing. Interface is the other class example. When Ray Anderson set the Mission Zero goal in uh, 1995, they didn't know how they were going to get to zero negative environmental impact, but they innovated over 25 years and they got pretty close. Uh, the dead, deadline was 2020. Um, having said that, often uh, the emergence does happen as a result of the rapidly changing conditions because either the crisis or the, um, the changes uh, create spaces for entrepreneurs, especially today social entrepreneurs, to really make a difference. And if they time it just right, if they respond to those conditions, to what society needs at the moment, then those are the things that will rapidly scale. And sometimes it's hard to see, but you have to look for the signs. And I'll give you one example, right? We know that fossil fuels has to go into decline. And yet we, we see uh, it seems to continue and continue. And in fact, they continue investing uh, in, in new fossil fuels. But then you see this uh, emergence of renewables and you see those, those cost curves coming down very rapidly and you see the convergence of technologies. And then just in this past week, BP has announced a $17.5 billion write down on their books in the next quarter. Because suddenly as a result of both COVID-19 but also the fact that that's causing a more rapid uptake uh, for renewables means that they no longer foresee such a positive future for uh, for oil and gas and uh, and coal. So it can happen that way as well. Do you want me to take another question, or should I go on to the integration, uh, the integrated value? Yeah, yeah, Professor, please, please. All right. So. How do you get there? I mean, what, how do you translate this then into something that companies, that organizations can deal with? Let me talk you quickly through this, uh, this integrated value web. What we see here is on the outside, uh, the systems that we're all a part of, economic systems, social, ecological, knowledge, and human system. And within each of these systems, we see areas of systemic breakdown, basically the fragmentation of the system. So we see disruption of which, of course, the pandemic is a, is a very strong example now, but there are other disruptions. There are natural disasters, there are social uh, or economic crises, uh, there are industrial accidents. All of these can have a shock on the system. And when you get that kind of shock, then you do get the market responding. And when the market responds, it's through the resilience economy. These are all the solutions we bring to help us to mitigate that risk and to ensure continuity through that crisis and out the other end. So think of COVID-19 right now. All of those services that are being uh, created and, and delivered, all of the products, that are helping us to get through, whether it's uh, PPE or ventilators that are being uh, produced, you know, uh, companies like Tesla pivoting, uh, automotive companies as well to make uh, ventilators. Um, but also insurance is, is in a good example in the resilience economy. Uh, insurance helps us to survive through disruption. 
And this is all along the path of innovation that makes us more secure. So that's the first test really for uh, uh, a CSR or a sustainability uh, responsive companies. Does it do anything to make us more secure? The second test then is to do with the social system where we have of course still a lot of disparity. Uh, this is a, to do with inequality in the system as well as uh, discrimination. We see it now of course with Black Lives Matter but uh, uh, inequality and discrimination exists in many many forms and we shouldn't forget all of those challenges that we face. Income inequality is still an issue. In fact, it's uh, the gap between the rich and the poor has gone up in almost every uh, country of the world in the last 50 years, despite the fact that more people are coming out of poverty. The rich are getting richer faster than the poor are getting richer. But think of other things as well, right? Gender inequality. In fact, the gender pay gap has gone up in the last 10 years, not down. It's getting worse, not better. And on current trends, it would take more than 200 years to close that gender pay gap, which is completely unacceptable. So here the response from the market is the access economy. Everything that we do to make the economy more inclusive, to allow people to work, whether that's including minorities or uh, ensuring gender equality or um, making sure that we have good uh, policies against discrimination or that workers in the supply chain are fairly treated and compensated. Uh, all of this is creating a set of solutions that mean we will be have a more shared future. Some of it is actually about sharing resources as well. It can be, uh, for example, uh, uh, there's an app called Hello Tractor. And this is an app, it's like an Uber, for farmers yeah so it, it's been invented in africa in east africa and if you're a farmer and you have a tractor and your neighbor doesn't you can uh, get them to sign up to the app and for a very small cost they can use your tractor when you're not using it this creates inclusion on the ecological system the force of breakdown uh, or trigger for transformation of course is degradation we've lost uh, two-thirds of our uh, wildlife species uh, populations in the last uh, 50 years uh, and of course we have climate change we have resource issues around water and so on and here the, the the most promising response is the circular economy so getting to a system where there is zero waste where things either go harmlessly back to nature because they're bio-based and they're biodegradable and compostable or they go back into production because they're designed to be remade, reused, remanufactured, and so on. And we're starting to see this in many, many areas now. It's very promising, but there's a long, long way to go. And this, of course, is to create solutions that are more ecologically sustainable. In the knowledge system, we have disconnection. So here we have the digital divide where um, of course, technology is not equally shared. Uh, some people are, are learning today at a young age using virtual reality. Other people don't yet have a mobile phone uh, or an internet connection. So that digital divide actually exacerbates the inequalities in the system. And so uh, anything we can do to close that gap through the digital economy, to use uh, to use technology to empower and connect people has to be part of the solution. There is another part actually in the in the developed world now where people are starting to be de disconnected from the economy by the technology. So automation and uh, robots and so on. And, and that's something we really have to take care of as well. How do we allow people to adapt, reskill and deal with that? At the moment, uh, 25% of all jobs are in a high risk category of being replaced by machines. But these are smart solutions we can bring. And then finally, in the human system, we have discontent. Uh, the opposite of being content, which is to be satisfied, is discontent. And this has to do with a lack of health and well-being. Uh, of course, something like the pandemic is, is a, 
a real classic example now how it can devastate our lives, our economies, kill hundreds of thousands of people, and we have to be able to respond to that. But let's also not take our eye off the ball. Most people today are dying through non-communicable diseases. Um, so these are diseases of lifestyle. They're to do with our diets, to do with our uh, uh, activity or lack of exercise. They're to do with toxins in the environment. So I'm talking, of course, about heart disease, about strokes, about di diabetes, and about cancer. This is what's killing most people today. And then there's mental illness as well. One in 10 people in the world today suffers from some form of anxiety or high level of stress to the extent that it affects their ability to cope and to, to be productive. Uh, for some, of course, it leads to depression or to suicide, and that number is going up. So how do we respond to that? Everything we can do in the well-being economy that takes care of those issues, whether be stress or disease, health uh, and happiness, that must be providing us with satisfying solutions. So integrated value then is in the middle. Yeah, this is everything that ticks more than one of these boxes. If you've got a shared solution that's also sustainable, or you've got a smart solution that's also secure. And so I'm really encouraging you, and I think I'll stop sharing at that point. I'm really encouraging you to use this as a test for your CSR or your sustainability actions. How many of the five can you actually uh, say that you're meeting with the products and solutions that you're bringing to the market. Which of these big systemic challenges uh, is, it, is it helping us to solve? Because these are really difficult challenges. Um, I will pause there. I will say that um, there is a methodology for implementing integrated value, which I won't have time to go into today, but you can look it up. If you look up integrated value management, there are seven steps of integration. They start with integrating at the level of the, uh, the system through systems thinking, then through uh, stakeholder integration, then uh, down at the level of uh, the values of the company, then the purpose, the strategic goals, then the metrics, then the products through innovation, and finally through the policy engagement that the company does. So let me pause there and see if there are any other questions while you're also taking your poll. Yeah, yeah Professor. So, uh, as uh, you have highlighted that uh, how important it is for all the five C's and E's, uh, the pandemic has reinforced the links between the health environment and the economy. So, uh, OECD countries are the largest donors of, uh, we can say, the ODA, Overseas Development Assistance. But at the same time, they also have the policies in place to protect and subsidize their own national industries. And that too at the cost of the developing country economic opportunities. So the question is that in a developing economy uh, like India, uh, it's impractical to stop the new units from launching but balancing growth with sustainability is also critical. So how do we ensure uh, the resource efficiency while ensuring you know, the healthy cities, adopting strategies from our past to conserve the nature and its resources? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because especially in developing countries, um, I think you're feeling it even more, these dilemmas that we face in sustainability. Uh, I mean, I also have uh, the knowledge of so the South African situation where I spent a lot of my life, and it's it's probably similar to India, right? They have to start making choices about do you allow people to die from starvation because they can't have a livelihood, or do you run the risk that they might die from COVID-19? And so these are really tough uh, political decisions that are, are needing to be made, and and. I can fully understand uh, opening up the economy again, uh, even though the risk is high and we, we will definitely see second and third waves. We're seeing a second wave in China now. And those are risks we're going to have to live with and manage as best as we can. But I think for for companies, you know, it's 
it's a question of how can how can you be as resilient as as possible this is one of the the first tests can you survive whether you're a small business or a large business by adapting by pivoting by being creative by finding new ways to reach your customers or indeed uh, new products um, uh, I mean, I give a silly example here. We we drive past a, a, a restaurant uh, quite often here near where we're living in Norfolk in the UK. Of course, all the restaurants are closed. Suddenly, uh, this restaurant has started selling uh, plants for gardens. It's become a garden center. Very successful because that's allowed you. You're not in a confined space. He's selling it all outdoors. And we spoke to him and he said he's not sure he's going to go back to the restaurant business because this is doing so well. So just by being uh, sort of flexible and adaptable, uh, that's, that's the step number one. But then it's really just to, I, I think, try to keep these principles in mind. So as you're coming back to, to your business and you're under pressure, of course, just to, to make ends meet, but can you do it in a way that's inclusive, uh, that's that's uh, helping the most marginalized? Can you spare a thought for for those? And this is the time when when also philanthropy becomes important for those who have resources. You know, that's an appropriate response in times of crisis like this. Um, but then, can you be frugal? Can you can you innovate in ways that? Yes, we bring a solution now, but it's a solution that doesn't use a lot of resources and doesn't use, uh, create a lot of waste. Uh, can you do it in a way that is using smart technology? Uh, can you do it in a way that is uh, looking after people's health? So I think the challenges now are the same. There's these five uh, tests for, for integrated value, but in a way more difficult because uh, it's such a, a crisis situation. And that's going to to sort of show off the leaders and those that are really struggling. You know, there's that saying uh, that I like from Warren Buffett that you only know when the who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out. Yeah, and it's the same with CSR. You only see those who are pretending to do CSR when the times get tough because they're the first ones to cut the CSR budgets or to cut the people, or to start, uh, you know, uh, only focusing on the money, uh, whereas the others will find a way to do it uh, that is still based on the good uh, sustainability and responsibility principles. There are uh, further questions from uh, Mr. Krishna Swami, CSR uh, Spark. Please elucidate on the impact of systems thinking in agriculture and the role of corporate companies through CSR initiatives. Yeah, I mean, this this one is uh, is actually increasingly clear. We have a totally dysfunctional agricultural system. I mean, it is it is very uh, unsystematic. Uh, it, it, you know, what we've done is we've maximized one thing which is efficiency and the delivery of food. And so we've been very successful in the last uh, 50 years with that, the so-called green revolution and so on, but completely at the expense of both the welfare of the animals in the case of livestock and the health of the soils. Uh, and it's, it really is a disaster. I mean, I'm also, I'm living in the, in the middle of farmland here in, in the UK. And these are deserts that are around me. I mean, when the fertilizer is not applied, the chemical fertilizer, it's dead. So the response now is to be far more creative. There is, I'm sure you're aware, the whole movement of regenerative agriculture, which is very exciting. This is all about the health of the soils. Um, and there are other movements, organic, biodynamic, um, which are all part of the solution. One of the most positive things I've seen in the last uh, few months is that uh, Patagonia, the outdoor clothing company that's been very, very successful, a real pioneer in sustainability, they're a billion dollar company now, has started up a food division called Provisions based entirely on regenerative agriculture. Um, there are other solutions as well. I mean, vertical farming, uh, hydroponics, these are all 
sustainable solutions that we really have to implement right now. But of course, uh, why don't we get it? This is because of lobbying in the system now. And this is a problem in many places, the oil and gas lobby, but also now the agricultural lobby. Actually, they're quite tied together, the chemical industry and the agricultural industry, and, and they cause us to change less slowly. The final point on this, of course, is, you know, when you talk about agriculture, it's, it's linked to diet. And, uh, you know, I'm a vegan. I, I have been now for a number of years. I've been a vegetarian for 30 years. Uh, for various reasons, animal welfare, uh, ethics, but more and more and more, the reason becomes the environmental impacts of the meat industry and dairy, by the way. Dairy also has a massive impact on animal welfare and the environment, not that much better than the meat industry. So the trend towards uh, alternative protein and, and towards vegan and vegetarian diets, I think, is, is also very important. Thank you, Professor. So another is like uh, we know that the pandemic has uh, pushed many firms out of business and if not to the brink of collapse. So there is a question that, you know, what would be your recommendation for the small businesses where the cost of integration is really high in comparison to the large businesses? Yeah, I think uh, Small businesses, of course, it's it's much tougher. They don't have the resources uh, to necessarily survive as easily. So, um, what I find in in uh, looking at at small businesses over the years and seeing how they respond to CSR is that they've got one thing going for them, which is often small businesses are run by the founder. This the the owner founder uh, managers. And these are normally people that have a very strong sense of ethics. Uh, they're people who are meeting their customers every day. And so that purpose-driven uh, element of, of small businesses, I think, becomes even more important now through, through the pandemic. Um, so having strong leadership by the owners, you know, that will help to motivate and inspire the those that you work with your customers and your suppliers and your employees the second thing i think is that uh, smes need to look at collaboration you know uh, individually they might fall but together they might stand and so especially on implementing some of these things uh, i saw this for example in guatemala right the individual farmers of the sugar there were too small to do csr on their own so they got into cooperatives of 30 uh, or so farms and together they could afford to have a CSR manager who was really looking out uh, uh, for these issues and implementing things. So pooling resources, having partnerships, I think is, a, is another really important approach for, uh, for small businesses. And then the other is uh, is simply to focus on the efficiency element, you know, frugality. Sometimes it's necessity is the is the mother of invention, and so you know having that that approach uh, where you really look at the eco efficiencies, especially, I think becomes even more important. Where you can find cost savings because you produce less waste. You have uh, less water that you use, less uh, less energy, and so on. Yeah, so probably the last question, if we can take up, is that uh, uh, so it, it is definitely becoming more important to understand that what drives some forms to be more ethical and more socially responsible, uh, particularly when resources are restricted, survival is under threat. So what are the governance factors that are needed to be considered? And just to clarify, do you mean governance at the government level or at the organizational level? At the organizational. At the organizational level, yeah. Well, here, um, governance is very strongly related to, to leadership, of course. So there's that part of it. And I've studied leadership a lot with Cambridge University, with Antwerp and others. And what we find actually is that purpose-inspired leaders, purpose-driven leaders have different characteristics 
to other leaders. So they have systems thinking, they have a long-term perspective, they have empathy, they have uh, creative adaptability, um, they have inclusiveness. So all of these traits or characteristics are things that we can, uh, can actually learn and teach. Uh, we do it at Antwerp Management School through a course we call Global Leadership Skills. Um, so that's one thing. You have to really invest in your leadership, but not just any kind of leadership training. It needs to be leaders for the future. And that means different uh, skills are needed. The second thing, of course, is you need to invest in transparency. You know, governance isn't really governance without uh, ethics and transparency. And so this is uh, the importance of uh, disclosure, of reporting. And there are there are different ways, of course, to do that. Some will use GRI, Global Reporting Initiative. I would encourage people to look at the Future Fit benchmark, which is a far more systemic uh, reporting model. Um, but even publishing information about the supply chain, about the conditions of workers in the supply chain, uh, I think that's important. And then starting to measure the externalities, the social and environmental impacts of our uh, of our uh, activities. So there are methodologies that are emerging on that. There's value to society as a method. Uh, there's true value, which is uh, KPMG's method. There's total impact assessment, which is uh, PWC's method. Uh, so there's a lot interesting going on in that area as well. Um, I want to end just though by by mentioning governance from a government perspective as well, because we really don't get to scale. Uh, we don't get the uh, society-wide changes we need without the support of government. And what government really should be doing is not telling business what to do, but setting the standard. What is the goal? What is the level that we want to achieve? Uh, and that needs to be very specific and very quantitative. You know, what is the greenhouse gas emissions level that we want to achieve by 2025, 2030, and 2050? Um, or what is the uh, what is the level of worker rights that we want to achieve? And then leave business to innovate to get there. Hold them accountable, of course, make sure that they're reporting against progress on that, but don't try to micromanage business. Don't tell them what to do. Don't make it all about philanthropy. That's a different discussion, mandatory CSR. Uh, that's one, one form of, of responsibility. But if we're gonna get to integrated value and my whole message of emergence then it's about setting those stretch targets for business and then through emergence, allowing them to innovate with the solutions. And then you'll be amazed uh, how many of these problems we will solve. Great. So, uh, thank you very much, Professor, because now it's a, you know, we have really understood that how the pandemic largely looked as a global crisis also provides the with an opportunity in defining the norms, the social norms, the practices, and the priorities towards a transformative, sustainable society. Yeah. So uh, uh, thank you very much for, for your time. And uh, we greatly appreciate on behalf, again, on behalf of IIC. Thank you very much. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are just uh, closing uh, this webinar. Thank you very much for your uh, active you know, participation for putting up these questions. And so certainly we'll continue the series and we're looking forward to uh, continue with some more expert sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you.